Well, thank you very much and, and welcome everybody to this week's talk on George Howard. Um, as Matt said, yes, uh, tomorrow, um, the 31st of July, is, is what we deem Howard Day. It's a, a kind of new festival that we've, we've tried to introduce last year. Why the 31st of July? Because that actually is the day in 1952 that George Howard opened Castle Howard to the public. So rather than any particular member of the family's birthday, that seemed rather an appropriate day to mark. Um, obviously, our, our celebrations are rather muted this year. Um, instead, I'm going to give you the talk uh, on George Howard, who it also has to be said, it is the centenary of his birth this year. So we are really wanting to make quite a lot of, of, of Howard because he was such an important figure uh, in the second half of the 20th century. And in fact, um, this talk is drawn from a publication on him by myself that will be coming out uh, in the city later this year. Well, we live in a fast moving and frantic age. Uh, pick up any newspaper, turn, tune into any current affairs program, and we're assailed by opinions on politics, culture, technology, nationality, economics, and so on. Let me cite some examples. In the world of technology, we're experiencing an explosion in communication. The wizardry of digital and video means that television sets have become multi-purpose communication instruments. And the multiplicity of choice of what to view and how to view is by turns fascinating and terrifying. In broadcasting, the BBC faces cuts and political pressures. Its obligations under the charter more strained than ever when there is less consensus at the political centre. Elsewhere in the media, aggressive journalism and the ability of the telephone to intrude on all our lives have tarnished the reputation of the press and thrown into sharp contrast the need for responsible control and the fear of external manipulation. Across the multiple jurisdictions that make up the United Kingdom and Europe, debate rages over national sovereignty. Some claim that only with a federal constitution can nationalism cease to be a burning issue. Others that England, Scotland and Wales must shed themselves of a spurious British identity. An era of diminishing resources means that the cultural capital of the country is threatened. But whilst the state rose back, the efforts of those who champion and defend heritage means that government has in effect got heritage on the cheap. And in the historic house sector, there's recognition that these stately piles are meaningless without public support. Their cultural and social uses for the local community are of great importance. But equally, there's a strain on the conflicting needs of preservation and maximizing public access to the treasures of the past. We can run the risk of killing the very thing we love. Well, views and comments such as these greet us on an almost daily basis as we digest yet another budget, adjust to a shifting political spectrum, and reflect on the state of society and culture. And yet, the above remarks and opinions have not been drawn from today. They are among numerous pronouncements made in various walks of life by George Howard and many of them date from four decades ago, when he was at the peak of public life as chairman of the governors of the BBC. Well, this is not to proclaim George Howard a prophet. He wasn't a visionary in the sense that he spent time crystal ball gazing, but he was a man who on numerous occasions emphatically declared, as an individual, I live in the present and the future rather than in the past. An admirable sentiment, we would think, for one who wished to engage in public life and to work for change. And this drive for social and personal betterment is, of course, a classic Whig principle, wholly befitting for the owner of one of England's grandest Whig houses, Castle Howard. But that very statement, as an individual I live in the present and the future rather than in the past, is also a very startling thing to say when one is the guardian of a house and a landscape that are among the most precious instances of national heritage 
dating back for more than three centuries. So can we reconcile these two perspectives? George Howard, the energetic mover for change, and George Howard, the savior of the past at Castle Howard and elsewhere. Well, he was a passionate preservationist. And between his devotion to that particular corner of North Yorkshire that was his ancestral home and his tireless work in the national sphere, he also remained passionately loyal to the city of York. Opening BBC Radio York in July 1983, he reminded his audience that not only had he championed local radio for many years, he had also ensured that York was included among the cities to receive a radio station. York, with its 2,000-year history, he declared, was the second city of the kingdom, and the brochure for the launch encapsulated the county's riches. Farming, cricket, coastline, rail communication, the White Rose, and a view of Ripon Marketplace juxtaposed with one of York Minster. It was designed to make the point that the city was the focal point of Yorkshire. But never one to miss an opportunity for self-promotion, he also made sure that the inside of the brochure was, it bl was blazoned with another of the county's success stories, both past and present, as Brideshead revisited, reinvigorated public appreciation of Sir John Vanbrugh's famous Baroque mansion. Well, George Howard was born in 1920, the third of five children by Geoffrey and Kitty Howard. And George Howard is on the extreme right of this picture, standing on the south front steps of Castle Howard. His father, Geoffrey, had inherited Castle Howard after the death of his parents, the ninth Earl and Countess of Carlisle. At that point, the family estates of Yorkshire and Cumbria were shared amongst the couple's surviving children. And Castle Howard had, in fact, been offered to their eldest daughter, Mary, married to Oxford Don Gilbert Murray. She had declined it and passed the estate to her younger brother, Geoffrey. So this was the world that George grew up in, with his elder sister, Christian, seen here with the beret in the middle of the picture, and his older brother, Mark, on the left-hand side. And he was followed by two younger siblings, Christopher and Catherine. And their father had enjoyed a political career as Liberal MP and had been a friend of Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. But the children lost both their parents in the 1930s. And by the middle of the decade, the estate was administered by trustees. Mark, who had come of age in 1939, showed little enthusiasm for the house and concurred with the idea of either selling it or leasing it long term. The view was that places like Castle Howard were white elephants. Their day had been. They were nothing but a liability. Well, this debate over the future was interrupted by the outbreak of war, and a temporary solution was found when Queen Margaret's school occupied the building. After Eton, George began his first year at Balliol College, Oxford. And among his passions were music and reading. But unlike his brother Mark, who was consciously preparing for a career in politics, George's future was less certain. With the likelihood that Castle Howard would before long cease to be in the family, his options might possibly be to farm some of the surrounding land or pursue a career in business or politics. What he did not expect was that by 1944, he would be the sole heir of Castle Howard after the death of Mark in Normandy and Christopher in Bomber Command. And nor can he have anticipated but that by the end of the war, Castle Howard was a near wreck, with a significant portion of the building damaged in the calamitous blaze of 1940. Aged just 24, Major George Howard returned from serving with the Green Howards in Burma late in 1945, wounded in the leg. This is the only known image of him whilst on service overseas, enjoying a drink with a comrade in the hot temperatures of India. And like so many people, he'd witnessed things that would have been deemed inconceivable a few years before. His life had been transformed. Offered the chance to return to Oxford, he declined, 
And many years later, in a speech at the University of York on the occasion of his honorary degree there in 1981, he drew attention to his lack of qualification, explaining that in 1946, feeling immensely old and somewhat frustrated by these seven years of war, I found myself anxious to embrace the real world. So instead, he chose to study accountancy in Leeds, a grounding that would stand him in good stead throughout his life, as he wrestled not only with the Castle Howard finances, but also sat on various financial and investment committees, and later would do battle with the government over the BBC's funding. Like many landowners in the post-war years, he viewed the lack of sympathy towards historic houses and their owners with mounting alarm. And he recognized his antipathy was partly ideological, but also driven by the treasury. And he would frequently express his concerns over levels of taxation and financial support for the historic house sector. And so his ability to read and digest a balance sheet was arguably of greater value than the degree in history he abandoned. Besides which, he was a lifelong autodidact, a man with a deep intellectual curiosity and wide interests. He was an eclectic and voracious reader, and in turn, this made him an informed thinker. By 1949, he had negotiated the departure of the school from the house, and in the same year married Lady Cecilia Fitzroy, daughter of the 8th Duke of Grafton. The couple lived initially in the gatehouse, but by 1952 they had moved back into Castle Howard and made the bold decision to open it to the public. And they were among the vanguard of owners who were giving birth to the heritage industry as we know it today. As if the challenges he faced in this damaged mansion were not difficult enough, eradicating dry rot, installing temporary roofing, stabilizing the southeast wing, retrieving the collection from wartime storage, surveying a succession of crumbling monuments across the estate, he also battled to recover from the gunshot wound to his leg. In 1948, this provoked a thrombosis and brought on phlebitis, and he was required to wear an elasticated stocking for the leg for the rest of his life. Well, the war had meant family and architectural tragedy, but ironically, this meant that his own future, once unsure, was now very precisely determined, and Castle Howard was fortunate to be in the hands of this passionate owner. Had his brother Mark inherited, there seems little doubt he would have followed the advice of trustees to break up the estate. In 1944, George Howard had fiercely opposed the sale of books and paintings authorized by the trustees. And these sales yielded disappointing sums and saw the loss of priceless books and manuscripts and 161 paintings at Christie's in February 1944. He particularly resented that far away in India, he had not been party to these discussions in London, whereas his two brothers had. By the end of the 1940s, it's clear that he was determined to inhabit and restore Castle Howard, but also to play a role in public life. He was motivated in part by his position as an important landowner in Yorkshire, but he was also of a generation that believed in the virtues of public duty. It was a strong tradition from within the family, as his ancestors had trodden the paths of local and national politics and served good causes. But another reason that drew him into the walkways of heritage was undoubtedly a love for houses and landscapes, but also a belief that they were important and had to be protected and championed. By immersing himself in the finer points of building conservation, local planning, urban and rural legislation, agriculture, forestry and tourism, he would gain greater knowledge and expertise, as well as intellectual pleasure from comprehending and helping to influence the fate of the nation's built and natural heritage. And this was a reciprocal process. What he learned at Castle Howard would serve him well in wider spheres, and the experience he gained there could also inform his decisions about Castle Howard. 
Now, his relationship with the city of York lies principally with his work for the York Georgian Society and the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. He was a leading figure in both societies as chair and president, invited to join them by two York stalwarts, Oliver Sheldon on the left and John Morrell on the right. Now, the post-war years were difficult ones for the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. With shrinking membership and straightened finances, there was also the difficult question of the museum and the gardens, their upkeep, their possible transfer to the city, and later the restoration of the observatory. But one of the biggest battles for the society in the early 1960s was over the fate of Queen Margaret's Arch at the edge of Ex Exhibition Square in the city. This was threatened with demolition by a new road proposal. To the fury of the society, an article in the York Evening Press in February 1962 painted them as obstructive. To begin with, Howard urged a conciliatory approach, keen to avoid the opposing parties becoming too embattled. But by the end of the year, even he accepted there was an impasse and little point in meeting with the council. However, the respect that he commanded, his reputation as a man of reason who, while holding principles, would look for ways of resolving disputes, paid dividends when early in 1963, the council blinked first. And Councillor Wright conceded that organizations like the Yorkshire, York Georgian Society and the Yorkshire Philosophical Society had been misunderstood and that the council had been at fault in their abrupt approach. So the arch survived, although a little bit has been nibbled away. Well, George Howard was never a man to stand still for long. He was always busy and traveled abroad regularly with visits to Russia, the USA, Egypt, and throughout Europe. He was also a hands-on owner at Castle Howard. Thus, in 1964, he reported that he was personally busy rehanging pictures and rearranging the furniture in the house in advance of the new season. And he began to recognize the strain of so many commitments, intimating that perhaps someone else should chair the society. And this suggestion was in part because of other pressures, but also because he felt that the chair should be taken by someone knowledgeable in the disciplines of the Yorkshire Philosophical Society. Well, in this remark, we see two things that would surface repeatedly throughout his life. One was a reluctance to take up positions if he could not discharge his responsibilities properly, and second, a recognition that he was not necessarily the best qualified person. And more than once, he would declare himself a rank amateur, humbled in the presence of scholars and specialists. What he failed to appreciate was that societies and organizations, and eventually government, sought him out precisely because he was not an expert. And in an address in 1969, he took back some of this ground by declaring, I hate to see narrow specialization, though I realize that unless there is such specialization, it's unlikely that really fruitful advances will be made. And he went on to make a plea for exactly the kind of intellectual curiosity that typified his own approach to life. The more there are of us around interested in many things, he declared, the more likely it is that we will get the harmonization we require. Well, it has been said that Howard was idiosyncratic, difficult, and required careful treatment. And there may be some truth in this, and certainly his time at the BBC was colorful. But the same could probably be said of most leading figures in any organization. Very rarely will their views and manner of working accord with everybody all of the time. It's clear, though, that he exercised charm and efficiency and supplied direction. And in turn, he commanded respect, loyalty, and even affection. He could manage people, lead meetings, implement strategy, work closely with able deputies, and above all, seek solutions. As he was later to confess upon his appointment as governor of the BBC, he liked to understand how organizations worked. What makes the wheels go round, he said. 
Well, the 1960s was a critical period in the conservation battle for York. In the eyes of many, the city council had often been the problem and not the solution to the complex equation of conservation and development. The watershed moment came in 1969 with the publication of Lord Isha's report, York, a study in conservation. Many individuals and groups grew impatient with the lack of response on the part of the city council. And Howard helped mobilize a campaign for the report to be acted upon, submitting a public letter calling on the council to declare itself in favor of Isha's proposals and for the city fathers to give a lead. But gradually his public life was taking him away from Yorkshire. He became president of the Country Landowners Association and in 1974 began a four-year term chairing the Meat and Livestock Commission. But he continued to mix his core interests, eclectic as these were. Thus, traditional country matters were balanced with a love of contemporary art and design. His passions encompassed the past and the future, the arts and the sciences, preservation and progress. And in this respect, he was a figure who looked to bridge C.P. Snow's famous two cultures, the polarized worlds of arts and sciences so divided from one another as claimed by Snow in his famous lecture of 1959. Speaking of the past, Howard would say, we draw from it guidance for our future. But he also believed that we find scope in the history of science and in the new methods of science. His inclusive view meant of the world meant that he was ideally placed to join the Council of the Royal College of Art, an institution unique in occupying what he termed as a no man's land between science and design. And throughout his life, Howard was interested in breaching entrenched positions in looking beyond narrow specialisms and limited perspectives. This is what characterized his intellectual trajectory. His contacts in London, his desire to find working solutions, and his recognition that preservation could not always be at the expense of progress, meant that he played a pragmatic role in these debates. And he could call upon support from the highest level. Michael Parsons, the sixth Earl of Ross, a sometime Yorkshire neighbor, was chairman of the Georgian group. His wife's cousin, Lord Euston, was a member of the Historic Buildings Council and the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. The guest speaker at the 1948 AGM of the York Georgians had been Lord Methuen, his cousin. And his close friend, Rupert Gunnis, was another influential voice in the world of heritage and conservation. And Howard would write endlessly to people, inviting them to speak to the York Georgian Society. And among those he secured were, clockwise from the top left, the architectural historian Nicholas Pevsner, who had been a friend since he'd stayed at Castle Howard whilst working on his North Riding volume of the Buildings of England. Another architectural historian on the top right was Sir John Summerson, who was dismayed to learn of the hard and fast rules that, the, that slides were not permitted for talks to the society. On the bottom right, Hugh Casson, who had been architectural director for the Festival of Britain. So this roll call of distinguished speakers during the 1950s and 60s balanced issues of preservation with a better understanding of the need for progress. And so in 1959, Howard wrote to his friend Robin Darwin, principal of the Royal College of Art, seen on the bottom left here. And he invited him to speak with the following steer. There's a certain amount of smugness, ignorance, and conservatism in all societies such as ours. If you could speak to them with all your love of beautiful things from the past, combined with your responsibility for and close contact with all the most modern trends in art and design, it would do them an enormous amount of good. And Darwin rose to the occasion and delivered a spirited talk. Hardly surprising when you look at this photograph more closely, here is a man remarkably managing to smoke a cigarette and eat an oyster at the same time. Four years later, Howard invited town planner 
Colin Buchanan to speak. And his report for the Ministry of Transport on how towns might be adapted for growing car use was just about to be published, leading the Times to describe him as aggressively pro-planner. An equally technical talk had been given in 1960 by Harry Thompson of London University on new methods of recording old buildings. And Thompson, a pioneer in the new science of photogrammetry, was able to base his, much of his address on the work he was doing at Castle Howard in preparation for rebuilding the dome that had been lost in the fire of 1940. In 1968, the cartoonist and designer Osbert Lancaster addressed the society on the subject of the future of the past. He and Howard shared identical views, namely that the past must be preserved, albeit with the proviso that not all of the past was of equal merit. And at the same time, they were enthusiasts for the contemporary and preservation should not strangle the dynamic of progress. But Lancaster's cartoon a year later captured the danger that Howard had recognized, namely killing the very thing one loved. And we can see in the caption at the bottom of it, the director or the chairman of Mammoth Hotels declaring, gentlemen, let us get our priorities right. Historic buildings must not be allowed to stand in the way of expensive accommodation for the tourists who come to see these historic buildings. While Howard, who was impressed by the South Bank complex in London, designed for the 1951 Festival of Britain, once declared that architecturally, a new and exciting common language was being evolved during these years. Nevertheless, the new was fraught with risks. While the best was full of character, the worst was, he declared, a vast amorphous mass of mediocrity. So these juxtapositions of old and new echo the spirit of the 1960s, the age of Harold Wilson's white hot technical revolution. This was the dawn of understanding the value of huge technological advances. And Howard must, be, must take credit for energizing the program of speakers in ways that not only reflected his own interests, but which put the city of York and the societies there in a position where they could counter accusations that they were anti-progressive. And in that speech of 1963, in which he coined the phrase white heat of revolution, Harold Wilson also stressed that this advancement would not become a reality unless we are prepared to make far-reaching changes in economic and social attitudes which permeate our whole system of society. Howard was a man who looked to defend certain values, but also to make far-reaching changes. And what he did share with Wilson and others at the time was a vigorous can-do mentality. And he would repeatedly call himself an optimist. And in his own enthusiasm for technology, this dated all the way back to the first gramophone he was given at the age of 10, which he promptly proceeded to tinker with and upgrade. In 1963, his London flat was designed with cutting edge technology, including centralized air conditioning and vacuum systems. And he was a persistent champion of technical advances in broadcasting. For him, the doctrinaire and the ignorant had to be challenged, whether this was an unquestioning defense of the built heritage or a blind championing of the new. The York Georgians, he stressed, was not a group of highbrows dwelling in an ivory tower. They were vigilant campaigners and realists. So he urged the establishment of a photographic library, both as a record of the city, but as an evidential resource in the campaign to protect. And he recognized too that the society owed a firm duty to scholarship. Well, much of his work with the York Georgians was taken up with fights to monitor and save endangered buildings. And the casework was extensive. The situation across the UK in the 1950s and the 1960s with regard to historic houses was very grave. In 1950, the Scours report had tried to find a solution to the countless houses that were empty, decaying or threatened. This was a key document in the survival of houses in the latter part of the 20th century. 
and it's been estimated that nearly one house a week was being lost during these decades. And this was a roll call that reached a dismal climax in the seminal exhibition, The Destruction of the Country House at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1974. And Howard would contribute a trenchant essay to the accompanying catalogue. So in order to acquaint himself more clearly, he toured the county of Yorkshire. But despite the society's vigilance these years, saw a high profile of losses in the county. Again, top from the top left, clockwise, 1952, Halnaby Hall near Darlington was demolished. A year later, Kirk Leatham Hall in Redcar was broken up. And in 1955, Wigginthorpe Hall, built by John Carr of York, was sold to a breaker. Haxby Hall in the bottom left was reprieved in 1950, but lost a decade later. And the situation in Yorkshire was described as appalling. More houses, again from the top left clockwise, these under threat included Howsham Hall and Alby Park. Bottom right, Coick Hall near Goole and Cusworth Hall near Doncaster. And then in the centre, Newborough Priory in Coxwell. The Georgians fought against an insidious pattern of piecemeal erosion. A few acres sold here, swathe of trees cut down there, the dispersal of contents, knowing that these episodes would reach a tipping point in the life of a house when there would be no way back. The Georgians looked for new owners or new uses and argued that conservation could prove less expensive than demolition and rebuild. And Howard's rescue of Castle Howard gave him first-hand experience of how narrow the margin could be between survival and loss. But along with these losses, there were success stories. A school venture, rickety to begin with, saved Howsham. The reprieve came just three days before the contractors were due to move in. At Alby Park, the Wynne family renewed their commitment to the house, as did the Wombwells at Newborough. Coeck was rescued when a chemical company acquired it for its headquarters, and Doncaster Council stepped in to secure Cusworth in 1961. The York Georgians were active in towns across the county too. In 1963, Howard argued against the demolition of Stone Hall in Stokesley on the top left here, robustly challenging the North Riding planning officer, but at the same time realizing that protective legislation was virtually toothless. No piece of paper can preserve a house, he lamented. When number 14 Nicholas Street in Scarborough in the centre was threatened in 1960, he wrote to the Mercury, pointing out that this was one of the earliest 18th century townhouses in the resort. The town clerk conceded these arguments were well balanced and that the proposed new de development would undoubtedly have its critics. And in his reply, Howard revealed that, I happen to be one of those who likes a good deal of modern architecture. I think it often blends very happily with the old. But the battle for Nicholas Street was won. And then in 1963, number 51 Church Street Whitby on the bottom right was reprieved when it was excluded from a compulsory purchase order. And local campaigner Rene Crampton wrote to Howard thanking him for his help and was particularly grateful that he had made two hazardous journeys to Whitby through snow and ice during the famous Big Freeze. She felt certain that his intervention had made all the difference. A curious structure with a personal connection to Howard was the fate of Robin Hood's well, built by the side of the Great North Road by Vambra around 1720 and paid for by Howard's ancestor, the third Earl of Carlisle. This is a contemporary drawing on the top left by William Stukeley of 1725. And to be here, we see a picture of it today. Well, the well had been dismantled in 1962 when the A1 was widened into a dual carriageway. And the campaign to reinstate it in a lay-by at Skello approached the society. And while Howard was happy to support them, he felt strongly that the Ministry of Transport should bear the cost. They, for their part, claimed that the onus lay with the County Council. At a meeting in, in 1963, 
The York Georgians felt unable to contribute to the fund, but the well was eventually re-erected. It can only be visited if you're traveling down the south carriageway, southbound carriageway of the A1 today. In York itself, the depredations to number one New Street in 1959, made by the Burnley Building Society here on the left, caused a furore, and the protests of the society put a halt to any further unlicensed alterations. The Georgians kept a close eye on the sorry state of Fairfax House in the centre. And in 1963, a young Geoffrey Beard made a detailed report on the interior, confirming that the marvellous plaster work had been done by the Italian Giuseppe Cortesi. And of course, Fairfax would undergo a renaissance some years later to become the townhouse gem we know today. A very far cry from its earlier iterations as cinema and dance hall. But one adversary that proved too strong was the War Office, which remained inflexible over the demolition of Fulford Cavalry Barracks on the right here in 1963. Well, Howard wrote to the Secretary of State for War with a reasoned outline for their preservation. But in February, John Profumo replied to him personally, explaining the economic arguments against retaining the buildings. The only concession was for the coat of arms to be saved and reinstated in the regimental museum. However, just one month later, Labour MP George Whig made his famous statement in the House of Commons questioning Profumo's association with Christine Keeler. And one is left wondering, had the scandal exploded uh, a few weeks earlier and precipitated Profumo's resignation sooner, whether this might have affected the fate of the barracks. It's important to realize that Howard was not fighting these battles single-handedly. He was aided and abetted by a band of equally vocal and effective preservationists, enthusiasts, campaigners, architects, and academics. But the fact remains that he was energetic, forceful, eloquent, reasoned, and courteous. In his address to the York Civic Trust in 1982, he remarked that, in the past, confrontation was often thought of the best method of dealing with the Philistines. And he conceded there were moments when battles erupted in the open and verbal blood was spilt in the press. But his preference was for quiet, continual work behind the scenes. I suspect, he said, that the most lasting achievements have been secured by those who operate in a somewhat smoother and subtler manner. And in this respect, Howard's political touch and contacts were invaluable. He could, talk, he could call upon people, make representations at the highest level, and recognize the root cause of inertia in the city, a lack of political will to engage with conservation issues. So one of his answers was to enlist local support. Not only did he know how to tackle his enemies, he also knew the importance of good allies, and he appreciated the value of the media too. Thus, in 1963, he wrote to local architect and academic Pat Nutchins, wishing to change the format of the York Georgian Annual Report. And instead of places the society had visited on jollies, instead to illustrate buildings which their efforts had saved, or buildings which were identified at risk. And Nutchins, who eventually succeeded as chairman of the York Georgians, was a kindred spirit and a more direct agitator who battled with Alderman Burke on television in 1964. And Howard was to praise him as a mixture of gadfly, catalyst, visionary, and interfering outsider. Words that might just as easily describe himself. And such was his social and geographical mobility that he was an extremely well-connected individual. And in 1972, he was appointed a governor of the BBC recommended by Willie Whitelaw. During the 1970s, he met with various political figures and he was personally close to Ted Heath and distressed when he was deposed as leader of the Conservative Party. He worked hard to convince Margaret Thatcher of the need for a good relationship with the BBC eventually securing a three-year settlement for the license fee. But he was lambasted over the BBC's coverage of the Falklands War in 1982. 
Although he took part in Conservative Party fundraising events, he was far from being a dyed-in-the-wool Tory. In 1979, he was realistic enough to know that the return to power of the Tories did not herald an era of government largesse for the heritage sector. And indeed, Mrs Thatcher once accused him of being an untypical Tory. This he would have taken as a compliment. And it's important to remember that when he was raised to the peerage, he entered the House of Lords as a crossbencher. So what are we to make of this remarkable personality? There's his energy and capacity for sheer hard work. Aside from his public life, he was busy rescuing and restoring the fabric of Castle Howard, with work on Bamber's Temple of the Four Winds in the 1950s, the rebuilding of the dome of the house in 1960, and the restoration of the mausoleum at the end of the 1970s. He was also making Castle Howard both a family home and transforming it into one of the most popular houses to visit with fresh attractions like a costume gallery, a rose garden, and popular events such as steam rallies, and of course, the canny sneering of Granada television to film Brideshead. And there were also other demands on the estate, farming, forestry, a caravan park, and developments essential to make the place commercially sustainable. Back in 1952, he had hosted the York Georgians on a visit to Castle Howard, and he's seen here animatedly explaining the building standing on the south front steps. And it's an image that epitomizes him as an energetic owner who led from the front. And he was also a man who knew how to exploit the benefits of PR and image. So in 1968, on the top left, he happily took part in a panel show at the Castle Museum in York. And three decades later, in the very week that he was awarded an honorary degree at York University, Castle Had hosted the popular game show, It's a Knockout, on the BBC. So while revering his ancestral home, he recognized that its appeal had to, apply, had to, um, had to span the high, the middle, and the lower brow. And increasingly, the house and himself as a very distinct figure became synonymous, both acquiring a high profile in the public mind. Castle Howard was to some extent George Howard. George Howard was Castle Howard. And his range of activity beyond his home was exhaustive and ultimately exhausting. And his life was not without its personal battles, such as his drinking, which he finally took in hand in the 1960s, the loss of his wife in 1974, and later the onset of diabetes. In 1973, he was a founder member of the Historic Houses Association, establishing a national platform to lobby government and provide support for hundreds of owners whilst arguing their value to the tourist economy. And in the last year of his life, he was appointed chair of the Museum and Galleries Commission. His record of continuous public service was not a throwback to the old-fashioned paternalism of his ancestors. He was an example of someone who set out to help mould and change post-war Britain, safeguarding all that was most precious and special whilst championing progress and advancement. In 1982, at the ceremony to bury the BBC time capsule at Castle Howard, he, re he reiterated his long view of things, perspective that looked backwards as well as forwards. Capsule is not due to be opened until 3982. All that I do and believe, he said, is rooted in continuity. But to have a sense of history need not inhibit evolution. At heart, he believed in what he called vigorous individuality, but not at the expense of working for the Commonwealth, to use an old fashioned term. In wearing so many hats, he was in effect pursuing a set of parallel lives, but they were, in his view, complementary. Howard was stimulated and nourished by each strand of activity, and in turn, he contributed significantly to each sphere he moved in. Not for nothing did he devise a new family motto when he was raised to the peerage in 1983. Casting aside the 
diffident tag devised by his ancestor in 1661, volo non valio, I am willing but unable, he substituted the altogether more dynamic, credo ergo facio. I believe, therefore I do. So thank you very much. That's the end of today's talk and we can reconnect with Matt and I'm very happy to take any questions that people might have. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, so as Chris said, um, more than happy to take um, questions if anyone does have them. So you can ask us a question by kind of hovering down towards the bottom of your screen and there's a button that says chat. Um, if you click on that button, you can then type message um, and I will then put the question to Chris. Um, just before we get going, Chris, um, just a quick one from me and that in, there's a box in the archive that belongs to George Howard that is my favourite box, I think, um, just because of the label on it that's called flamboyant, uh, flamboyant, groovy caftans. Um, so do you want to just maybe explain a little bit about that? Well, I mean, in a sense, George Howard's, I mean, reputation, he's famous for three things, really. Castle Howard, the BBC, and for wearing caftans. And he was um, a snappy dresser. I mean, he certainly could dress in the way of a country gent in, in tweeds or in a city suit when he was in London or things like that. But as you saw in some of those later photographs, he kind of favoured sort of rather floral and kind of Hawaiian style shirts, but he also uh, enjoyed wearing caftans. Now that was very much a thing of the 60s. Um, and of course it caught the popular uh, uh, imagination at that time. And so it was covered in the press and so on. I think it was just part of his larger than life character. Um, I mean, I think it has to be said that he was a, a large man too. So caftans would be comfortable garments to wear. Brilliant, thank you very much. So, so some of the questions that are coming in now, Chris, if that's all right. Um, so we've got one here that says, when stately homes are demolished, do the families lose everything or are they um, often compensated in any way? So there's a second part to that, but I'll let you answer that bit first. No, I mean, by the time our stately home was demolished, it had usually parted from family ownership. <clears throat> so this is what I mean, that the, the kind of decline is rather insidious. You begin by perhaps selling the contents or selling off a bit of land, chopping down a belt of trees until there's nothing left but the house, clearly no um, resources to kind of maintain it. So very often the family would, would move out and it would become a crumbling wreck. It would fall prey to developers or breakers or whatever. Um, and it's a long dismal story in the middle of the 20th century. And again, it's very well told in that destruction of the country house exhibition catalogue from 1974. There's also a young man called Matthew Beckett who runs a lost heritage website um, that you can go to that chronicles we we think now it's probably 2000 country houses were lost demolished or burnt or whatever destroyed in the course of the 20th century so these were not taken away from families in the way that they would have been in say eastern europe confiscated from families where they literally lost everything overnight um, this is a more kind of protracted um, process of decay and decline and just related to that as well, someone has asked if there's any books that you can recommend on lost country houses of England, um, other than obviously the one that you showed in. in I can recommend lots of them. <laughs> in fact, um, the best thing I could say is, is, first of all, if people would like to go to the Yorkshire Country House Partnership website, uh, and don't worry if you don't get all this down because... Um, uh, I can respond to any emails. But on, if you go into that website, there is uh, eventually a tab that has resources, with a whole set of reading lists on different um, uh, subjects to do with country houses, landscape, decorative arts, architecture. But there is one on, on heritage and loss and decay. And there are a lot of publications there. Um, and that's actually been a very popular niche in publishing. You know, we've countless publications like The Lost Houses of Lincolnshire, The Lost Houses of Devon. Um, and Edward Waterson in the city of York did a, a wonderful series of lost houses of Yorkshire and Durham and, and the Northeast uh, about two decades ago. Um, and again, they're full of atmospheric pictures of lost houses. So it's, it's, a, it's a big reading area, but it's always fascinating to look at. So we could probably send a link to the Country House Partnership website out with them. Yeah, next we week can do time. that. Or if anyone wants any more specific things, I, I actually have a PDF of that reading list, which I could res respond to by email. 
Thank you very much. So I am going to jump about a little bit with questions. But okay. So just because I'm, I'll try and keep the ones that are all relevant together. Um, so we've had another one come in saying that are there any stately homes um, kind of in 2020 that are currently at risk of um, well being pulled down? I don't think that there aren't many. There are risk houses in um, states of decay. And if one goes to look at the, the Great Preservation Society, Save Britain's Heritage, they have a, an annual kind of buildings at risk register, as indeed does English Heritage. Um, these would be abandoned buildings that are, I mean, have been empty and lost for a long time that are perhaps in danger of disappearing imminently. In terms of other houses at risk, I mean, obviously running a historic house is, is, is a difficult thing. I mean, they are the proverbial money pit. They consume eye-watering quantities of money just to kind of keep the roof on and repair it and so on. Uh, and many of them, the financial equation between being open to the public and generating sufficient revenue to be able to keep them a going concern, it's a very fine balance. And of course, no more critical than the very time we're talking about at the moment when so many houses cannot actually open uh, in the way that they are used to doing. Um, now, that's been the case for Castle Howard uh, since the outbreak uh, and lockdown in March. We've gradually been able to reopen a step at a time with the garden centre, the gardens, the adventure playground. And you know, very, very pleasingly, um, we can say that from tomorrow, um, Friday the 31st of July, we will open the house again. But this time it's only on two days a week, a limited uh, operation as we feel our way back into whatever the new normal will be post pandemic. So the threats are, are there from a multitude of angles. It could be extreme weather, it could be crumbling stonework, it could be death in the family, it could be high taxes, it could be a pandemic. Um, country houses are always under threat in some way or other. Absolutely, and I'm sure that this period will eventually be viewed as a huge risk to, to a lot of houses. So, um, but so nice to see, as, as many people will know, that places like, especially ourselves, are managing to reopen again now. And especially it's on a date which has so much meaning for us as well. I didn't even make the, the connection that it was the date that we'd originally opened to the public. Yeah. Um, so just to jump around slightly, yeah. um, another question that we've got here is, um, do we know what's inside the time capsule or is it a secret? No, we, we know a bit of what's inside it, and, and there is a little book that was published at the time. I think it's quite difficult to get hold of on, on the uh, internet now. Um, it's called, the book is called Messages uh, to the Future. Um, yes, it, it, meant it had the large kind of cylinder with state-of-the-art technology then, which meant microfilm and things like that, and it tried to kind of uh, present a, rep a representation of um, human culture, world culture, um, so that if uh, an alien finding it in 3982 could understand what was going on on Earth. Um, and it had a lot of kind of obvious things like Shakespeare plays, uh, a Mozart symphony, the score of it, and, and various things like that. There was a bit of a furore because some popular newspapers were included too, because this was felt, you know, to have a cross-section of, if you like, cultural activity. Uh, and therefore, um, the inclusion of, I think it was the Sun newspaper, caused one or two people to raise some eyebrows. But the idea was that it, it had to be a, a kind of representation of, of all of what was going on um, on Earth at that time. Absolutely. And what might be quite nice for people to listen to at some point is that the, um, the interview that you did with Nick Howard, where he yeah. talks about kind of what the house or the estate may look like at the point where the time yeah. capsule is due yeah. to be open, which is, which is one to keep an eye out for. Um, so another question that we've had is, what did George Howard think of his grandfather, the ninth Earl of Carlisle? I don't really know. I mean, he, he did make comments about members of his family in, in some of his um, speeches and things, but I, I haven't actually, he hasn't actually very few kind of opinions about them. When he talks about his ancestors, it's usually in the context of they did this or they did that. They built Castle Howe, they collected the paintings, or uh, he did refer to obviously his grandfather being a, an artist. So no, I mean, he hasn't written down lots of kind of reflections on his ancestors. Thank you very much. And then another one here is, are there any plans for an extensive exhibition on his impact on Castle Howard? Would love to do that. Uh, he has an enormous archive. I mean, all of these talks that I, I've given over the last 16 weeks now, I mean, 
none of these would be possible without the huge archive that we have at Castle Loud. I mean, we are so fortunate that the, the Howard family uh, is one of those families that never threw anything away. So we have a, a rich and extensive archive that covers 300 plus years. So from that, we can excavate literally all of these stories that you've been listening to uh, in the course of these lectures. Well, George Howard has, uh, I can't remember how many boxes it is, it's nearly a hundred boxes of papers divided between his personal life and his public life. Now, because these are relatively recent papers, they haven't all been comprehensively indexed, particularly his personal ones. But we made a start on that a few years ago. Um, and some of that is, as I say, is contained in the publication that's going to come out on him uh, later this year. But no, I would love to do more on him, uh, his personality, what he did at Castle Howard. And, and in a sense, some of the lectures I've given talked about restoration. That, that's that's a, a George Howard story. But I think it's just really interesting to put him into the context of what's happening in England in the 50s, 60s, 70s specifically. Um, but also, I mean, to find out more about his war record um, and then growing up in the 20s and the 30s when the future for Castle Howard was, was rather uncertain. Um, would love to do it. I mean, uh, and I'm sure it's an idea that we'll come back to again. We're being very cautious in forward planning at the moment. But um, no, the appetite certainly on my part is there to do that. Good. So another watch this space. <laughs> um, and just obviously referring to Chris's book, um, do keep an eye out for when that comes out later in the year as well. It's been delayed by the pandemic, but oh, uh, we'll... It's ruining everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one final question from me, Chris. Um, if yeah. you had to pinpoint um, George Howard's greatest achievement um, throughout his life, what <laughs> do you think that would be? Well... I mean, there are many, and you know, and, and obviously people might say, well, I'm making special pleading because of, you know, working at Castle Howard. I mean, there, there are an awful lot, but I think if the single most important thing I'd say, and the most noticeable thing, is to rebuild the dome lost in the fire of 1940. Because to imagine Castle Howard without a dome, the building becomes meaningless. It's great architectural, you know, climax is, is missing. Uh, and so I think it's so important that he put that back but you know he did so many other restoration projects uh around the house and the estate and i think you know those campaigns uh to save other houses and also you know working at political level but no a strict answer to your strict question matt it would have to be reinstating the dome thank you very much um so i think that's all the questions that we've had come in for now chris um okay so, um we'll we'll tie things up there um so thank you very much again to everyone for joining us this week um a particularly interesting one um and we are continuing to plan lots of exciting content to bring to you in the coming weeks we've got collaborations on the horizon we've got possibly introducing different speakers so um you know it's it's definitely something that we plan to keep doing um moving forward into the coming months so do stay with us um so we'll be back next week won't we chris at 1 yep, we will. 1 okay. p.m next thursday so we will see you all next week um as chris mentioned the house does open um tomorrow um so if any of you want to visit please do you can book online um, via our website at www.castlehoward.co.uk and it would be really really lovely to see some of you in person up at the house soon so thank you from me thank you from chris and we will see you all again next week Thank you. Bye-bye.